tell you if you talk up. I think they can hear us. No. No, they can't. Are you it's sure? Fine. Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's, just, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. We just it's have okay. to be quiet for 10 seconds, okay? Come on. Come on. Uh, and there it goes. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> And we are live. Welcome, everybody, to uh, this week's us? episode. Did you... Yeah, we were whispering to uh, this week's episode of Dev Beard Ops, and uh, we're happy to report that everybody in the show has got a beard this week. <laughs> yes, Thank you yes. for uh, doing the effort, Marcia, to uh, fit in with our, you know, attire. And exactly. <laughs> the casual look and the beard. I could not shave my hair, but it was beard ops, so <laughs> it was not bald time. So I'm good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we, put, we didn't put the ball in the title at all. Yeah. <laughs> that would be more challenging. <laughs> so, yeah. so for for today, as you can see, we have got uh, Marcia. On I will our, take my ear uh, off now because I'm used to the mask, but this is very hot. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yeah. yes. We need to no, make no, some no, yes. some merch with the beard hats or something like that. <laughs> we, we can give out to people. I oh, yeah. <laughs> There we go. Marcia's back. I actually realized we didn't even set our background very bad on us. So, Darko and Marcia, welcome. Um, today, we are continuing our conversation from last week, which is what is serverless? And basically just having the discussion saying it's not just about using AWS Lambda to run some code in a function. It's it slightly be. more than that. No, <laughs> we've, we've, we've heard there might be like maybe one or two more services that you could use. And uh, um, last week, Marcia was actually on the stream watching um, and made some comments, and then we just decided, hey, listen, uh, we actually have a serverless expert um, in our midst um, yep. who even has a whole YouTube channel. So, yes, Marcia, you're allowed to talk about your YouTube channel today without paying the promotion jar, which is great. <laughs> um, but before we do that, uh, Marcia, since you haven't been on the stream for quite a while, why don't you introduce yourself to our uh, viewers? Sure. Uh, I'm Marcia. I'm also a developer advocate with these two dudes here. And I have a beer temporary for like two minutes and I was melting. Uh, I talk a lot about serverless and managed services. So as lazy as you can go, as I will say, the least amount of code that you can put, the better. <laughs> and I've been working in the serverless space almost from the beginning of Lambda. So Lambda was launched in 2014, and I started tinkering with Lambda in 2015. And in 2016, I have my first service up on production with a lot of traffic on, on Lambda. So since then, I have not used any other cloud uh, service for putting my compute. Uh, so I've been all Lambda. <laughs> mm. Very good, very good. Yeah. And I'm also a developer advocate. <laughs> I'm, I'm also a developer advocate, and we're all based kind of, uh, we're all in similar time zones. Um, Kobus is very far south in South Africa. I'm in Berlin, and Admaris is just a bit to the east uh, in Finland. And to up. the northeast. And up, yeah, <laughs> north very east. north. Yeah. And up, and up. And um, hello, everybody who's joining us. Um, so just, just kind of to, to reiterate, because I've seen that we have just now started streaming mm. on one of the Twitch platforms. Just to reiterate, this is a weekly show called Dead Beard Ops, where the beard doesn't matter. Um, we. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's it the beard matter. on the inside. Yeah, it's the beard on the inside. There we go. That matter. Yeah, <laughs> and we, we we like we like we like to talk about uh, uh, DevOps, technology, automation, the cloud, AWS, all the fun things out there. And um, this week we are talking about. Well, actually, we're continuing the chat about what is serverless. Uh, is that a thing you eat? Is that a thing you put on bread? Or actually, how do you migrate to serverless? And Marcia is here too, as an expert, as her long experience with serverless, to kind of chat with us about that thing. Yeah. So quickly before we kick off, um, firstly, the usual can, uh, audio check. Let us know if you are happy with our audio levels because we have no way actually of seeing that we have the same levels. Um, and then also, please keep the conversation going in chat. We are looking at it across the different streaming platforms. Um, and Fallen has just pointed out that uh, apparently I made a typo in application. Yeah. And <laughs> I apologize for that. I did schedule this stream at, I think, 11. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I shared at 11 last night, I think, just before going yeah. to bed, which was might explain that. So apologies for that. We will try and fix that in the end. Yeah. Um, Thank cool. you for the audio. Thanks, Loss Algorithm, for confirming the audio. We just want to make sure that we all are relatively close uh, by when it comes to audio quality and levels. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So 
let us kick off. So basically last week we had a discussion about uh, what the different um, serverless technologies are. We touched on a couple of them, but uh, you watched a bit of that show, um, Marcia. So why don't we put you on the spot and say, listen, you're a serverless expert. Tell us what is serverless. Well, I think uh, my definition of serverless is like the, I think very close to what AWS definition of serverless is. So I will say that any technology is serverless if it adheres to four promises. Uh, so that's how you can evaluate if something is serverless or not. And also serverless might be an expect spectrum. I don't know how you say that in proper English, but like uh, it's not binary. So you might have some services that are more serverless than others, and that's okay. Uh, it's up to you to pick the one that is suits you the best. So when something is serverless, you can think that it scales automatically, meaning that you don't need to worry about if it scales up or down. Uh, so you can go to sleep, your service can go viral, I don't know, in Korea at three in the morning when you're asleep and your website can take everything, you can get all the orders and then it will scale down as soon as those Koreans go to sleep and you don't need to have a headache about it. So isn't serverless something you can buy in a box? Uh, I thought like the same like DevOps, right? Can you buy five units of serverless or? No. Uh... <laughs> there are many, many, many services that are serverless. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's not something you can buy in a box, but there's many managed services um, right. that are like serverless. So yeah. another concept that you need to have in mind is the high availability. So if you're coming mm -hmm. from the instance work, you know, you need to put your instances in different availability zones. When you work with serverless services, they're regional. So they will be distributed all around the regions, uh, the availability zones, sorry, in, in one region. Uh, another thing is you don't have to manage infrastructure. So no picking your operating system, not picking uh, your, I don't know, uh, CPU, storage, or things like that. That everything comes uh, mm -hmm. by default. There is some there is some things that you might have the possibility to tweak, but those are more for your configuration than for the infrastructure mm -hmm. itself. And mm -hmm. then you pay as you go. That's a very cloudy thing, but with serverless, it can get uh, very granular. For example, when you use Lambda, you have to pay for one millisecond. It was a hundred millisecond uh, before reInvent, and that's something I think uh, it was possible because yeah. of the how Lambda mm -hmm. now is able to really get things in a, so granular that you can have a billing of one millisecond. Mm. So somebody saying my Lambda uh, takes uh, 0.5 milliseconds to run. Why I have to pay for one millisecond? Because yeah. that's how it works. <laughs> that's, <laughs> um, yeah. that's actually so, got an opportunity. He's our, yes. he's our data hero. So I, I think he's... Um, <laughs> I don't think he's too serious on this one. So, are you good on it? <laughs> Before, that was exactly the same question when it was 100 milliseconds. My Lambda takes two milliseconds to run. Why I need to pay for 100 milliseconds? Because that's how the platform works. It's, uh, I think it's very powerful now that Lambda can really uh, be able to bill you in one millisecond. I think that proves the maturity of the service. So, uh, I think that that was a, a very interesting move uh, from, but, from but can AWS. You run, no? Can you actually run a Lambda function in less than a millisecond? Is there like a, I have not. I have not seen it. Right. So that's my question. I, think, I don't know for one millisecond, but few milliseconds. Yes. If you yeah. are just doing a hello world or something in yeah. like something very simple, then yes, you can definitely run in a few milliseconds and and maybe less than ten milliseconds. So okay. that was people were complaining. And sometimes you are uh, one of the things that you can tweak in Lambda is the memory. And when you tweak the memory allocated to your machine, you are also tweaking the CPU. So yeah. you can make now, because you are built in one millisecond increments, you can also uh, tweak your memory to get faster processing and, and get your functions to return faster because now you're built in a smaller increments. Before you were paying, if you make your uh, lambdas to run faster, you were paying for a lot of idle time. Maybe if it was running, um, if you give, I don't know, two gigas to me of memory, so the function run faster, and it was finishing in, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, you were paying for 90 extra milliseconds. But now, if you really want to make it faster, you will pay exactly for the time that is running. So I think that's um, that's really cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, you know, I, I think the way we can, and, and this also forces people to do the more optimization on when it comes to Lambda functions. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I initially, and now this is this has been a debate I've heard with people. You can use something like, now I'm not an expert, but Express JS. Um, 
you can run a full stack application in a single Lambda if function, If you want right? to. If That's you want. That's what I call a fat Lambda. Uh, fat Lambda. lambda. <laughs> <laughs> has, has the limitation of, of the 15 minutes uh, run. So if you can make your function yeah. uh, run in less than 15 minutes, and that's one of the migration strategies is the lift and shift kind of yes. thing. If you have something that is already an express function, maybe you uh, express service, maybe you can add a little bit of tweaking in the API layer and, and, and just place it inside a function that you can do. Also now Lambda support container images. So you can also pack your code inside a container image and then do a a little change in the uh, connection between the um, Lambda uh, platform and the and your Lambda function, so it works, and then the rest can stay exactly the same. <laughs> so yeah, but actually, let's chat about that. I think that's a very good point. Um, how would one go ahead from um, their own application? Uh, let's call it a, a non-serverless application. Make it serverless. How would they migrate to? Mm. It? Mm. Uh, what are the things that we should think about when migrating our application? Because that's the question, right? I, I come and talk to customers saying, hey, you should try to apply serverless practices to your application. They're like, but how? <laughs> how do I take yeah. my... I think my, my first I have here. my first question to whoever whoever wants to migrate to serverless because when you migrate to serverless you might need to re-architect your application to enjoy the benefits of serverless. If not, you might have a very complicated <laughs> application <laughs> without any benefits. So my question always when when any customer wants to say I want to migrate, I will ask you why. What why your application that is working, that is uh, doing what it does, why you want to migrate it to serverless. Some customers might say it doesn't scale, doesn't matter how big my instances are, uh, it doesn't work. I was talking with a bank uh, last week and they were saying that they migrate to serverless because they were doing batch processing of uh, investment uh, calculations. And then they were using these really big bare metal machines and they were still not able to scale. But with Lambda functions, it didn't become faster the compute but now they were able to put thousands of millions of lambdas doing all the things at the same time and get the scale that they needed to do these investment calculations that they're mm -hmm. super complicated so that's a really good reason to migrate to serverless and make your architecture um, mm. serverless so yeah, first that's my first <clears throat> question <laughs> First question of many. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. My camera set up my cable was a bit tight. It seems I had to move it now. So I should be back, hopefully, and not just smiling like an idiot for five minutes. <laughs> it's okay. Smile and wave. Smile and wave, Kobus. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a good, good point. So, uh, you know, when, when migrating to, an, uh, to a serverless mm -hmm. application, or if you're mi migrating your compute platform to a Lambda function, I think uh, just the fact that you you think about oh well Lambda function only has 128 megabytes of memory or four gigabytes or whatnot that's no, not enough more apps. Ten gigabytes now. Ten gigabytes now. Okay, okay. So you don't treat it as that. I mean, you should not treat it as a monolithic place. You do uh, no. treat it mm. as something as you said, multiple parallel executions of the same. That gives you the benefit, and you have the ability to scale up. You know, I I, I wrongfully think of it as compute threads. They're not compute threads, but you can kind of no. think of them in such a way, right? So, mm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think when, when you are thinking about migration, you always need to think is that it's something that you want to lift and shift. So, for example, if you are not in the cloud yet, maybe your first strategy is to move your application into the cloud yeah. and then move to serverless. Because if you are moving yeah, right. from on-premise to serverless, that's like changing everything. Your whole yeah. organization is going to be like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Sorry for yeah. my French. Uh, but they will be, that <laughs> feeling will be inside everybody's head because learning yeah. serverless is a different way of doing uh, distributed mm. applications. It's a new way of doing uh, systems. And then also going to the cloud is a new system, yeah. way of mm. doing things. So so don't do everything together. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent. Uh, there is that. Yeah, there is that perception where, uh, especially if people just lift the physical V. Uh, well, they go from physical machine, just put it on EC2. They say, okay, well, now we're cloud native and we're all good. It's like no, no, no. There's that's still the a lot of work step. to do. That, that's the first step. <laughs> that's the first step. Yes, but uh, yeah. dig into that a little bit. Like um, one of the the couple of ways to go about that, um, Marcia. What have you seen with that people do? Let's say I've taken my physical app that was running in my. Um, server room and i've now put it on in onto an ec2 instance it's not running yeah. as well and i want to start moving to serverless what 
are the first steps that you would recommend? I think the best thing you can do after you decided that this is something that you need to migrate is to re-architect your application on paper and think how you would like it to be. What is the parts? Because sometimes from an application, at least this is my experience as a 15 year developer, uh, not when you have an application, not 100% of the application is used. Usually it's the 20% that it's cost you the pains, the cost, all the problems. Most of the traffic is that 20%. So look at that mm. 20%, identify that 20%, and maybe that's the 20% you want to migrate. And the rest you can leave uh, for when it's... Uh, like uh, put uh, out of production and you build a new service because it, in general that happens with systems nothing is built forever so mm. start thinking about building microservices and grab that 20% of your application that is very critical and is very painful that you want to solve the problems so think about that architecture and then don't lift and shift it into a lambda yeah. function there is 20 million different <laughs> services that are out there to help you out to make your uh, application more scalable, more cost efficient, more maintainable. So I uh, start getting uh, like educated on all the different services. So for example, I think for enterprise uh, event reach is a great service mm. to start looking at. It's an event bus uh, that will help to make your microservices or your functions talk to each other in an event-driven way. You can not only connect it to Lambda functions, but all kind of other managed services within AWS, other accounts, other regions, uh, SaaS providers. So it's a very powerful mm. service that I would encourage everybody to, to learn. Mm. Yeah, and I'm digging into this comment here from uh, Jabasoft. Let me quickly pop it on the screen, which is, um, so it should have changed, not a complete rewrite. Um, and the, the thing here to remember is that when you expose your application, let's say you are hosting it on an EC2 virtual machine, you can put either or both an API gateway or uh, a load balance in front yes. of it. And both of those services actually support you to split traffic based on certain rules like the path or the host or certain um, resource headers that come in with a request, which means you can have your main application behind, let's say, one of them and everything goes there. Then you choose that bit of your app that you want to split out into a serverless function using AWS Lambda. Do that, get that up and running, make sure that it's working, test yes. it to your heart's content, and then you change the input mechanism. Say, listen, for that specific path, so let's say slash, what is it? Uh, hello. Analytics report. <laughs> that's, slash hell. Slash foobar. Let's go with slash foobar with a the theme put there. Then you can say everything that goes to slash foobar, send that to my Lambda function, and everything else will go to the old one, but which means you've now actually... With the application load balancer, one thing you can do is you can set, I want 20% of my traffic to my new hmm. version and 80% to my older version. So you don't even need to pass 100% of the traffic to your new untested in production Lambda function or, or <laughs> serverless, uh, whatever architecture. Uh, because mm. when I migrated my first project to serverless, we didn't have that. So one day we were, were sitting in our chair and we were like, okay, today is the day, let's do it. And we had uh, in the application I was working, we had around 6 billion views per year. So the traffic was sure. big. <laughs> so the moment we pressed this button, we were all sweating and it didn't work. So we needed to press it again to report <laughs> back um so now you can really pass a little percentage of your traffic to your new uh thing and try it and test it make sure that it works that it can mm. take the scale and then start pushing uh, traffic and it has the sticky uh, sessions so your customers will always be moving into this uh newer thing if they were pushed in that uh first time mm. to theirs to that place so that's something that's that's a very interesting point because uh, as you say, spectrum, um, serverless is on a spectrum, but also migration mm -hmm. to a serverless application is on, on a very big spectrum. It's not all or nothing. Um, you can have mm -hmm. portions of your application still be very much um, non-serverless and, and, and serve. And that's totally fine. Yeah. It's, you should yeah. not add in for a 100% serverless application yeah. because yeah. that's, I think, maybe in a greenfield environment you can achieve it, or maybe you yeah. cannot even achieve it because there is a place and 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 and. and like use cases for instances yeah. and, and yeah. correct correct absolutely i mean uh serverless and lambdas are not an end-all solution to all the things they, they maybe. are <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe but you know uh some sometimes some nah. things you need to work with potentially yeah. a lot of data fast disk disk access and a whole lot of things and legacy software as well um yeah. so it's fine to have a mix and match of your architecture as well and so, especially when you're migrating so would you say that uh 
depends. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, he's got his little things. Wait, he's it got his props. Here we go. Oh, you and printed. It's still not on... Yes. No, but he still needs to put it on cardboard. And he still needs to laminate yeah, it's, 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 three. I know. I'm the... But actually, it's... somebody told me that this is bad. You should not say it depends. The proper answer is... Let's have a look at your architecture and discuss it. What the right way is to do it. We are the we don't look at. No, 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 Yes, yes, of course, yes, yes. A DevOps unit comes with serverless yeah. as, a, as, a, as an addition. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kobus, you last time spoke about, you know, especially when we talk about um, uh, not having your entire thing as serverless, uh, you call it mm. strangulation or suffocation. What was it called? The, uh, the, 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 strangler, the strangler pattern. Strangler pattern. Tell us about that. Yes, the strangler pattern. Yeah. Um, so it's often you would hear that come up in talks where they say, how do you go from a monolith into a microservice architecture? Because like we've just discussed, going and doing one massive rebuild of the system and then releasing it as a big bang, like, hey, it's release day. Let's, you know, let's go. You will have a bad day. I mean, that's guaranteed. I've never heard of somebody who did that who actually had it go smoothly, especially from monolith microservices in one go. Um, so what you do is you take your monolith, your app that you just moved into a VM, and now you want to start moving to serverless. And then you decide, what is the first bit that I'm going to do? So you define that, rebuild that one part, make sure that it's working, and then you send, start sending traffic to it um, and make sure that it's working. And then you take the next part and the next part. So the concept here is like it's a, the, it comes not from strangling people. It comes from a vine on a wall where if there are a couple of cracks, the vine will slowly start breaking down the entire wall after time because it gets the root in there and then starts going and pushing it open and then breaking it in the end. So that's where the idea of Strangler comes out. Um, and that's how you do You start chipping away at your monolith or at your old app that you want to change the architecture to instead of trying to do everything in one go. Yeah. And how do you pick what to choose? That's a question I get. Like I tell them, hey, you should just slowly pull out things from your monolith. That's a great question. And, yeah. and there was one example uh, from a leg, uh, a serverless migration from the comic relief that okay. they did a serverless migration and you, they have, this is a, one of the reinvent talk a couple of years ago, and they started presenting like, well, we will start the migration with a service that nobody cares, something that is mm, yeah. very not used. So we are in a safe place to learn. So they started with some image gallery or something like that, but it was not relevant. If you don't know what Comic Relief is, it's an organization that takes a donations for, uh, they take the TV over one day. So basically it's one day of a lot of traffic, a lot of donations and donations are very precious because if you fuck one, then people will lose the trust in the system mm. and you don't want people to get billed twice. You don't want people not mm. to get billed if they make a donation. So they are very, very important type of transaction. So they wanted to migrate that to serverless because having that infrastructure set for one day a year was extremely expensive and they needed the sponsors basically to pay for that in order to get donations and, and it was pointless because they were wasting so much money. Yeah. So they wanted to migrate to serverless. But instead of starting from the donation service, because that was a very delicate one and the team didn't have the expertise, they started for something that nobody cared that it was an image gallery. Mm -hmm. So then the team started becoming more empowered. They were very free to pick the technology and, and, and to decide what to do and, I don't know, uh, play with newer things and shiny things because the business stakeholders were not over them. This was an image gallery, just like, who cares? Uh, but if they were saying, hey, I'm going to migrate our main uh, kind of thing into serverless, this has been working always, but, you know, I can make it better. The stakeholder was like, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> how you're going to deploy something that you never tested. So then they started by doing this, and then they start taking over a little bit of the big monolith that they have and start taking services that were not that big. But then at some point, they decided to go to the donate service. So instead of starting and take everything that was useless and, and do everything until they get to the bigger thing, they try one or two services to get expertise, to get empowered, to understand how this works, and then they went to the big 20% that I was meaning that that 
painful part that was expensive, that, that it could not handle the low, that was giving them a lot of headaches. So I think that's the right way to go in a team without experience. That, that's an excellent point. So uh, I, I think, I think you know, just choosing things that are not, I wouldn't call them too important because that's just bad. But I would say like no. also... Uh, but there are you know, services. There are part of your applications yeah. that are less used and they are right. less critical. Right. Let's call it less critical than less important. That critical can mean no exactly. other system depends. Nobody's um, like business depends on it. So, for example, in the case of yeah. Comic Relief, if the image gallery was down, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, exactly. It, w- it wouldn't hurt, hurt hurt the output. So, you know, exactly. we talk about we talk about business outcomes of your application. Exactly. You know, there's a specific part of your um, of your application uh, achieve well uh, push towards the business outcome Mm. maybe yes maybe no so this is a prime example of a thing you can Mm. try to convert to serverless and i love that fact you know i as koba says like you would never go ahead and just convert everything to microservices on a single you know friday afternoon um you would take little bits you know push and and that gives you the ability Mm. like just remove a code base from your from your monolith right take something out and build it differently and the most amazing thing I found is that you could replace a lot of that by services, right? So if you have a, a, a part of your code base that's authentication, why not use something else? Cognito, right? Mm. Uh, or y- you have something else that does, you know, some processing. Ship it out to a different service. Ship if you do mm. video, uh, what is called uh, video encoding, mm. elemental, Transcoder, right? elastic yeah, transcoder, to, exactly, or that. So all of those things are kind of can help you also like, hey, I don't have to even worry about this code anymore. There is a thing, let mm. me plug it in as a serverless service and, and it will do my job. So yeah. and that's why it's important that time for the team to get educated because it's very hard to learn the different services that are available just by reading AWS documentation, you will spend a whole lifetime. So if you start getting your hands on something, then you start realizing, oh, this is how Dynamo works and this is how Aurora mm-hmm. works. This is how queues work. This is how step functions work. This is how this works. So I will definitely uh, encourage hands-on. <laughs> I actually want to share something that I found very recently because um, I'm digging into some of our documentation and things is we have a very nice um, demo, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, hands-on uh, workshop type thing uh, to go through all the different uh, databases and covers DynamoDB, ElasticCache, Neptune, and DocumentDB. So I'm going to drop that in the comments quickly. And uh, apologies if I sound like a robot at the moment. I had to get up quickly because my daughter is back from her third day of school Ooh. and uh, it's going a little bit wild outside. So <laughs> if I do start sounding like that, it's because someone is screaming in the corridor. Apologies. <laughs> yeah, That's but um, okay. the the interesting thing um, that you touched on there is that whole point of picking somewhere where it's safe to make the change because that's often um, before I joined AWS I did a lot of consulting and often the consulting involved how do we automate our systems how do we move it to the cloud how we do that and the answer is always first if you don't have the skills take something that nobody cares too much if it breaks exactly. because. The, the fastest way to lose trust from especially management, because remember management is always scared of change because that might impact the actual bottom line or the what the app is supposed to do in your customers. So if you say, listen, we're gonna move to the cloud, they're already like, uh, we've, we've heard it's good, but you know we're worried why our um, servers that we hug, I love the term box huggers, by the way, um, is um, why do we need to change? It's gonna cost us money, why do we want to change? We don't need to. Yeah, Darko and his little server as well. Um, and so exact same advice, do small things, small changes, and also be have a backup plan like what happens if something goes wrong? How do I go back? Now, in the case of the strangler pattern that we discussed with a load balancer, if that Lambda function that you just did stops working, guess what you do? Application load balancer, 0% traffic, then it's fine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a little a piece of advice here. Um, as, as, as Koba said here, you know, um, you may make a mistake while you do something, so you should you need to pick something that is not too important. Um, mm. Let me tell you a secret: you will make Ooh. a mistake, no doubt it. You will for <laughs> sure make a mistake. Oh, so yeah. be ready for that. <laughs> it will not be smooth. Mm. So if you practice on thing, well, practice it sounds weird, but if you try your migrations on things that are mm. not critical. That's fine. You know, don't go ahead and migrate your main 
uh, customer user base or you know, something yeah. that is very important. And one yeah. cool thing of serverless is that you can build your whole production uh, infrastructure as testing and or dev, and you can load test it, uh, and you can like sometimes with with on premise that you cannot do, and even with instances it might be very expensive to do. But with uh, serverless, mm. you should be using infrastructure as code, and then you can get your um, testing environment up and then go and fire the traffic. Uh, you can even capture the traffic from a real production day and then replay it in your uh, new serverless thing and see how it reacts. And, and, and you can do this test uh, with not much work involved because capturing traffic, you have the API, so you might need to just add a, a couple of like mm. recorders of the traffic. So you can really play back and see what happens. You, and, and with serverless architectures, that's pretty straightforward to just deploy a mm. new environment and then tear it down when you don't need it anymore. And, and I think load testing for serverless, sometimes people think, but it scales automatically. Yes, but uh, <laughs> Darko? there is... <laughs> Darko? But, oh. <laughs> Yeah, there is soft limits. So if you're starting mm -hmm. right new AWS account, you will start finding the soft limits of managed services. They all do have them. They're there for protecting your wallet. So nobody can, mm -hmm. I don't know, hack your Lambda functions and to do million invocations at the same time. They have limits. So you all need to know. Yes, you need to know what are your limits and if you can increase them. Yes, it's one ticket to support. It's very easy, but you need to know your mm. limits. And then also know how your services connect to each other because one service might be totally cool. Another service might be hitting the soft limit. And sometimes uh, this is an asynchronous communication. So you might have uh, not mm. even potent functions. You know what are in the in the potent functions? I the potent. I the, I the potent. potent. I the potent yeah. I don't know how to pronounce my English, but that's, that's, uh, that's a very important concept when you're building serverless applications. Yes. Uh, yeah. What the documentation of, of Lambda says that uh, functions will, and, and it, this applies for all the event services. So for queues and for event bridge and for other services, uh, events will be sent or functions will be executed at mm. least once. So that means that you can mm. receive events twice the same event because the platform thinks that it might not arrive so it might send it again the function might get invoked again so your functions always need to produce the same um <laughs> output no if they have an input so for example if you are creating an account yeah. every time you receive a message and you're creating a new account you need to have mechanisms in place that to know that this account was created already and don't recreate it and and and, and things like that so you can make your uh, mm. architecture safer yeah. Item potency is very important, yes. um, and, and and you know especially on on a very distributed systems like a serverless application where you have a lot of different things working at the same time, it is very important that if you do a thing twice, you do not repeat that unless you really want to do that. Exactly. Um, so so that's that's a very good good point. Um, we have a question here from uh, well first of all comment from Dan. No matter how much testing you do, your customers will always find an ed oh, edge yeah. case. That is that is absolutely true. They're like toddlers. Yeah, use exactly. Groups save your cows, and then they learn how to use the stairs, and they Co reach farther. But oh, yeah. Co -co correct, correct. So, so <laughs> that is that is a very good point. Uh, you know, try to and uh, learn from that. Learn how your customers break your application mm. and use those tests in the future. Even though they're edge cases, mm. makes you makes yeah. you more confident on things. I and mean, uh, that, j sorry, just quickly on the previous one, there's that famous statement that says um, everybody has a testing environment. Some people are just lucky enough that it isn't their customers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from JavaSoft. Any suggestions for test frameworks, runner orchestration, runner slash orchestration, database services, just customer Jenkins, customer Jenkins pipelines, and Selenium, other popular frameworks? Um, I think there is, is a, a lot question. of tools, and you should use tools. You should not do it manually. That's my first recommendation. And whenever you're doing anything, I, I would encourage you to pick one tool and try to stay with that tool so everybody learns that tool. And, and, and if you are inside AWS and you don't have any other tool, 
go to the AWS tools. They come with the, all the permissions and the security that uh, yeah. for accessing, uh, for example, code pipeline is so simple to use. You can use Lambda uh, as integration test. You can do really easy use code build. So all the permissions are already there and, 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 and it's very easy to integrate. If you use Jenkins, then you need to manage the access to all your services. So if you don't have anything mm -hmm. and you don't have experience in the team, I will always recommend learn AWS tools. It will mm -hmm. make your life so much easier. But yeah. I love the fact so, that you can just use lambdas for a lot of things, right? Sorry, lambda functions oh yeah. for a lot of things. I, I use lambda functions for as part of my mm. testing. Just they yeah. will do things. It's so easy. Mm. So just just quick follow up on that is like for the people who do use Jenkins, um, I'm a long time user of it and I still love Jenkins. Um, if you use uh, EC2 worker nodes, you can actually use the IAM policy attached to that instance for your permissions to integrate with other services as well. So then you don't have to go and enter manual API keys into the configuration. So just keep that in mind if you do want to go that route. That's a good point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a uh, there's a comment here from where did I meet it? Somebody was uh, wait, 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 somebody somebody mentioned Sam. Yes, Krishi. Oh yeah. Any love for Sam? I love using Sam and Amplify CLI to quickly I love prototype Sam. things. Serverless application um, modeling. Yeah. yeah. So it's wonderful. I love Sam. Uh, I use it. Uh, I think I use it now evenly with CDK. And yeah. when I I choose CDK when I have things that are more non-functions or API gateway. So if I need yeah. to build a microservice that might have an Aurora or might yeah. have, I don't know, something that is uh, EFS or might have a VPC or things like that, then CDK is great. But if you're just doing API gateways, Dynamos and functions, Sam, yeah. it's really simple to get started. And I love Sam because I can set up a co-deploy Canary deployment in a single line. Yes. Like yeah. if, I'm the, if I want to show off Canaries, I will. I, I find it easier to do it in SAM than to do it in CDK. Although I have not like, dug into like SAM and CDK integration, which apparently mm -hmm. there is a lot of now. So, uh, uh, but I have a question for the audience. Um, tell us how you deploy your serverless applications. Uh, are you using <laughs> CDK, Terraform, SAM, serverless framework? Tell us what you're using. We want to know the console. The console. Who? Uh, no, no, no. Humans. <laughs> Humans, yes, we have labor to deploy our lambda functions. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, tell us, tell, tell us how you do it. Yeah, uh, uh, it'd be great to know. Um, and we have Terraform users as well. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, yep. uh, I'm Team Terraform. In case you're wondering, that guy, mm -hmm. that guy. Um, a question from uh, Ezea Diugu: uh, If I deploy an application on Fargate containers, will I have to provision storage, EBS, EFS, in addition to Fargate containers? No. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh -huh. What? Okay. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you want. Uh, it, you don't have to if you're using Fargate. You can. You can attach EFS to Fargate, right? Uh, well, I think you, you can. can. You you can. can. So Delta. I imagine you can attach it to Fargate. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me quickly segue into this, Darko. That meeting that we are having tomorrow night to set up the guests for our next stream next week, I believe, ah, on the 14th. Ooh, yes, what a segue! We will have <laughs> someone come talk to us about EFS, which is yes. the Elastic File System that you can attach to. Drum roll, please. Fargate and other that. functions, as well yeah. as a whole host of other things. So we will be addressing that yeah. next week. In a next lot week, yeah. Of detail. yeah, next week, make sure to join us as well in the stream. We're going to have a guest from the database, one of the database service teams uh, covering EFS, and we're going to talk about how can you actually uh, elastically but um, expand the storage mm -hmm. on your file system, on your functions, and, 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 and Fargate systems. So, should be pretty fun. But yes, mm -hmm. you, you can, but you don't have to. That's the thing. <laughs> Uh, I see a lot of comments here. People uh, see mm. Jabasoft is doing Terraform. Uh, iCodeCraft uses serverless framework. Dynamo, CDK, Krishi, Sam, uh, uh, Alexander G Gamerman, Gamerman. Uh, CDK pipelines. All right, we, we, mm. we, there's a lot of folks here using a combination mm. of things. I like that. Um, um, cool. I, That's the world I, out there. Yeah, exactly. Imagine I've never used... people use different software. Wow. It's not uh, it's not a single mindset. Wow, <laughs> um, I've never used a serverless framework before. Uh, I, I know it's that it's very a, similar than mm, Sam, yeah. uh, but it has. I, I like the plugin system. Okay, so mm, that's very cool. People can extend the framework from the community with plugins. So I think that's a really nice thing from serverless framework. So so mm. so let me take a step back now. Let's say I'm uh, owner of a news company and I have a software that. A CMS, right? Whatever we built it, and I want to 
take a specific piece of that software, uh, let's say a tagging utility. It's a it's a it's a module in my, my my application, and I want to create that as a serverless platform, or I want to start migrating that little thing. Where do I start? What is the thing I need to do? What is the thing that you, the engineer, the developer, needs to do there right now? Yeah, I think in serverless applications, the complexity is in the architecture and not in the code itself. Yes. You might end up with, mm. uh, we say that Lambda functions should be simple and do one thing and one thing only. Uh, so you might end with a lot of functions and other services. So I think the first step for anybody when they decide what they want to migrate is to sit down and understand what are the components, how the messages flow from one component to another, how, uh, what is the need of uh, synchronicity versus asynchronicity? Yeah. My English is great for these complicated Good. words, <laughs> but but that really changed. So for example, in my previous life, uh, we had to migrate a component and that, uh, because we were doing a video platform and we wanted videos around the world. They have different copyrights in different parts of the world. So people in China cannot see the same content that people in Finland or in South America, you know, copyrights. Uh, so we needed to, when we were doing this video platform, we needed to have different metadata for different users. So how we did it in the past? Well, every time a user made a request, we calculated that on the this is previous serverless. We calculated that on the server side and we returned the right metadata. Then we realized that that's pointless, that we can do this every time we update a new video that we updated a couple of times a day. There was not that many videos. We were a small platform for video distribution. Every time we put a new video, it was easier to run an asynchronous job that calculated all this metadata and distributed in the right countries when it finished. So basically now the customer will come and it will go to the edge get the right file and it was way faster for them. So that's a re-architecture rethink, like thinking from a very simple thing, I go and fetch a piece of data to I can do this beforehand, I can prepare it and I can serve it to the customer right away. Mm. So we reduce the amount of compute like incredibly, even though we were processing a lot of files at the same time, but Lambda gave us the capability to do that processing mm. because it's scale. So we were processing, yeah. I don't know how many countries are in the world <laughs> every time we uploaded a new video, but that was it. We did it once for every mm. video and <laughs> So that kind of rethinking is very important to take advantage of the serverless mm. architecture. So you need to understand what is the problem that that piece of code is trying to solve, uh, how your customers are getting served and your customers can be your end customers, other microservices, internal services, whatever. So think about that and think how you can solve this, the problem in the most asynchronous way possible. That will be the easiest path. The more mm. synchronous you need to go, the more uh, complexity you will need to add in your system. So that's why it's super important to try to think in the most asynchronous way. Think about item potency. Think about how things can be done in <laughs> in a different time frame than when they are requested. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's no, a, and definitely that's a good this time. is a this is also a good time then to, to chat a little bit about step functions because they mm. often help with this because step functions is a way to build a state machine where you say invoke something and then if it succeeds, do the following thing. If it fails, do the following thing. You can build this whole state machine in JSON and I believe we just released the YAML version of as well in terms of finding it. And what makes it so awesome is that that's something that you invoke initially was just a Lambda function. So you could have Lambda function one, two, three, and four that you would invoke, but now it's actually expanded to include a whole host of Edible services. Uh, even for example, spinning up a Fargate container. So let's say we get to this- Or SageMaker or other step mm. functions. <laughs> yeah, no, and, um, and what makes it so cool is that some people might go, well, I don't need a state machine or why would I need this? And the example we have on the site, which actually makes a lot of sense because it's easy to visualize is I'm gonna book a holiday. So first function is book a flight. If it succeeds, book a hotel. If it succeeds, book a car. That's the happy path. Now let's say something went wrong. Book a flight, done. Book a hotel, done. Book a car, failed. Now I need to roll back. Now I need to unbook the hotel, unbook the flight. And what you do is you can actually visualize all of this, the whole flow of it inside that state machine, which makes it super, super useful. Um, yeah. And also and now can... these uh, state machines, you can hook them directly to API Gateway. So basically mm -hmm. you can build the, 
the state machine right away. It's so simple. And now since reInvent, you can do it in a synchronous manner. So before basically uh, API Gateway was uh, uh, sending an HTTP request and the state machine started executing. And then you needed to have some system in the backend to manage the callback to return the result. Mm -hmm. Now, if your step function lasts less than 29 sec uh, seconds to invoke, that's the timeout from API Gateway, you can basically return uh, the result right away in your um, in your response, in your HTTP response. So that empowers people with the one millisecond billing to do functions that do one thing and one thing only. And those functions are easy to test. They're more secure because mm -hmm. when you are creating functions, you need to give permissions and you need to give functions are born without any AWS permissions. So you need to give permissions to the resources that they are going to touch. So if you have a very fat function, you might need to give permissions to million things. But when you have a very specific function, you maybe sometimes they don't even need permissions mm -hmm. because they are doing calculations or computations. Sometimes they are just storing something in Dynamo, so you just give the storage permission. Sometimes they are reading, so you just give the reading permission. So that's why I really, really like step functions because they really enable you to build good um, services that are easy to test. And they also externalize a lot of the logic. So all those paths, they're handled by the step function. So you don't need to add mm -hmm. the logic of what happens if this fails in, in, in the function yeah. itself, that's externalized in the step state machine. Mm. So yeah, those those nested if else because I still remember like I had a job at one point where if you've ever dealt with uh, an ORM, you may know about uh, managing the transaction of your database because how it works is you initiate the transaction, then you you do multiple changes, and then you cl uh, either close the transaction or you do a rollback on the transaction, so it changes everything or saves everything or reverts everything that you did to the database in that transaction. And that specific piece of code, the happy path was easy to follow, but there was a certain thing where if there was a rollback, you actually went through four different classes, and that <laughs> class, the last method in there, now get this, was a transaction rollback. And the first time I saw it, it's like, but there's no transaction here. Why do we have a rollback? And then you're like, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Up here somewhere, we created the transaction. So you don't have to deal with that kind of like crazy logic inside uh, your system. Yeah, especially yeah. Marcia mentioned that how complicated architectures and systems can be in serverless, uh, mm -hmm. serverless environments. So I think orchestration with step functions is orchestration the right word. I guess it is. Uh, mm -hmm. The workflow, the, the workflows yeah. with, I with step functions. Workflow orchestration. I yeah, will call it orchestration because yeah. this is like um, mm -hmm. you're orchestrating the the business logic how it happens. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So doing that helps a lot, you know. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you don't want to get mm -hmm. stuck in mid in the middle of something breaking and like how can you roll back and do those things? Especially, uh, I, I I like the like the analogy of uh, of a monolithic application uses uh, rigid connection. It uses like your uh, like like rigid um, I don't know how they call it um, axle bars on, on on vehicles, right? You have to rigidly move yeah, those things. You rigidly move things and you move other things and they have to move together. Mm -hmm. On a proper serverless architecture, things are much more decoupled. There's a string mm -hmm. or there's a, a message, a light, or something that kind of mm -hmm. is much more, um, it doesn't, it's asynchronous. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for other things to happen yeah. necessarily mm -hmm. for this thing to, and then hence rollbacks uh, and, 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 and you know, walkbacks are kind of complicated. <laughs> So yeah. you should yes. have some. And also, for very... example, if you are calling an external HTTP, you might need to have some kind of circuit breaker pattern in the way, and that kind of quite easy with step functions to do. Uh, so mm. if you want to do that inside your Lambda function, you might mm. be blocking the Lambda function. You might be having yeah. stuck. But if you have that built in the in the st state machine, it's way easier to handle. Mm. So I, I totally encourage people for within a microservice to use the step functions. Don't use step functions mm -hmm. outside of the microservice because then you are coupling quite high those microservices together. So for communications between microservices, I will encourage people to use something like event pass, event bridge, like an event mm -hmm. pass thing. So then the messages are flowing and things are more decoupled because when you're creating the state machines, it's not that you're coupling the functions together, but you, this state machine has a lot of coupling in the sense that we yeah. have this state, we have this state, we have mm -hmm. this machine, we have this thing. So if things change, then <laughs> everything yeah. can break if you don't have the control. So I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly the same as coupling your databases, where if you've got a database with multiple services touching it, if I change a service over here, or well, this service needs a database change, this service has changed. 
Now, all of a sudden, you've got your functions. If this one changes, this one needs to change because guess what? They are in the same state machine. Now, so, if they're inside the state machine, in general, the functions don't need to change, but the state machine might need to change because the state machine has the link to all these functions that uh, are inside the state machine. So they have mm -hmm. the Amazon resource name. The, well, they need to point to something. So if you have a change in there, then you need to go and update that. Mm. So there is there is some coupling there. I will say that uh, if for inside your microservices, that's totally cool. For outside mm. your microservices, when you don't have more control on what is going on, use something more asynchronous like event bridge. Mm. Or Sorry, just to clarify away. what I meant. <laughs> what I meant is if you have two, two separate microservices in Lambda functions, one state machine spanning both of them, that might get a little bit messy at some point. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, neither, oh, well, I think neither applies to three people as well, has English as a first language. We are all exactly. yeah. second rate English speakers. <laughs> um, yeah. So Ooh, there's a question a here. Of questions. Yeah, yeah, a couple of questions there. Hugo, good Okay. okay. So, uh, first question from Anshul. Um, let me pop it up on screen. Um, Will it be possible to discuss about callback weights for empty event loop and when it should be used in a Lambda and how it is different from a synchronous version of a Lambda function? I'm searching for that because I don't know my names of things right away off my mm. hat, you know? <laughs> okay, okay. We, we, we can come back to that one. Yeah. Um, mm. So, and the other question coming, coming in And from... it's coming from my channel. So just ah, okay, okay. comment in, in one of, in this video and I come back later exactly. asynchronously yeah. to you. Yeah. I'll just leave a comment on, on Marcia's <laughs> video as well, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> and um, cause yeah, hello, Mister Cause. Let's call you Cause. Uh, hi, a total mm. beginner here. I understand the hype around serverless, but in which scenarios should we not mm. opt for serverless? Um, so that's a hard us. question. <laughs> what do you think? When when not serverless? Tell us. So the first very. I would say easy answer is if you have a process that needs to run longer than 15 minutes. So think data transformation, ETL type operations, some kind of heavy processing that takes more than 30 minutes because a Lambda function minutes. 15, sorry, 15 minutes because a Lambda function's maximum execution time is 15 minutes, which means if you want to go longer, you need to figure out a mechanism that can store the data. So firstly, figure out how much before the 15 minutes do I need to stop start storing the data to not be cut off while I'm storing the data and then load the data again and restart. Yeah. So that's the first obvious example. And then also um, my next question for you is, can you re-architect that in a way that Lambda functions, state machines, and services that ingest streams our data can do it? Uh, <laughs> but that's a totally different question. <laughs> that's actually a very, very fun question because the easier answer to that at the moment is yes, especially since let's think you want to run that in a container because that you know that's going to run long, so you might want, might want to use, let's say, Fogit to run that for you. Because you can now use containers with Lambda functions. If you build your app in a way that the functions are all available in a single container and then they get invoked as different Lambda functions. You can have that same container be spun up in Fargate and actually then handle that processing for you. And you can string all of this together nicely with a step function. Yeah, so and let's say that serverless is, Fargate is a serverless uh, service. Even hmm. so... There's in... a server underneath, don't worry. Yeah, well, there is servers underneath uh, Lambda as well, and there is servers <laughs> underneath as free. Uh, but I'm saying that uh, Sir Fargate is a serverless service. It applies to these mm. four promises. Uh, you don't have to manage infrastructure. They don't even appear in your um, you know, EC2 console, like those instances. Mm. They're from uh, um, AWS pool. So <laughs> mm. enjoy. <laughs> No, no, definitely. Um, the other time where it starts making sense, we get that balance is that there's this interesting like curve in terms of cost where if your API is not very busy up until a point and very busy is a, actually a very large number in this case. Um, serverless makes perfect sense from a purely billing perspective. Then there's this gap in the middle where if you get above a certain range but below another very larger number that it makes sense to rather go the route where you've got an application load balancer as well as um, virtual machines running it. Because you can apply things like if you've got a base load, like savings plans um, to get high savings, which you can also apply to Lambda. That's a whole longer discussion in terms of like how to balance that costing out. But it just works out with the way the service costing is structured to actually use an application load balancer with backed by an EC2 instance. And then at the top end again, it becomes very, it depends type scenario where there are ways you can be a lot cheaper with serverless or a lot cheaper with actual virtual machines or containers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it gets a little complex. 
I have had a discussion with a customer a long time ago. They actually um, use Lambda functions in a wrong way. So they've uh, they've um, basically used Lambda functions for a lot of data transformation, and the Lambdas would run longer than 15 minutes. Mm. They would have a piece of their code was to re-invoke the Lambda functions once it reached the 14-minute mm. mark. Ow. And it was like, oh, this is very expensive. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe batch processing is better or something, or you know, yeah. just just yep. containers. Yeah, yeah. So mm. that's a bad way to do. It. Yeah, I think the question uh, that it should be asked here: when lambda function is not a good case, because I think serverless is such a broad term nowadays. As I was saying, mm. Fargate is a serverless component, and there is many other things that are still serverless that might run for more than fifty minutes and allow you to do all kind of things. So I think where Lambda cannot be used is a better question. Uh, and I think there, yes, you can start applying those 50 mm. minute rules. And like, sometimes you have a lot of data and you still don't want to, uh, I don't know, put it in a Lambda function. You can now, I think uh, that's something quite interesting. When I started speaking about serverless in 2016, I started giving my first talks about serverless. I always have a slide of what Lambda cannot do. And I think nowadays my slide is doesn't exist because it, it can do so many things and, and I have seen customers do all kind of weird things really mm -hmm. <laughs> that I cannot tell you what Lambda yeah. cannot do. Well, they cannot run more than 50 minutes, that's for sure. But the yeah. rest? <laughs> long, long, a long time ago, uh, Lambdas were five minutes limit, limited to five minutes. Yeah. That was the initial one. So, And I, and I recall yeah. people use Lambda functions then. I mean, serverless applications were starting out then, but people use mostly Lambda mm -hmm. for like some glue logic, just basically a thing that will do a thing if you do that. So. Orchestration mm -hmm. inside your AWS account and things like that. So I think the and also it's about how you orchestrate your application. It depends on the knowledge you have inside your organization. If you are very good at doing things inside one machine, in like maybe rethinking the whole pipeline to have a super serverless lean processing is a pointless exercise because you are not saving anything. Mm. But maybe if you are starting from scratch with a very serverless team, they will not build a process that is batch inside us instance. They will think on how they can uh, split it into parts, use managed services, and put it in a serverless mm. pipeline. So um, that's uh, everything can be done in multiple ways. So it's. <laughs> So there's another fun question here, which is what sort of automated testing can you build around lambdas and step functions? Um, Marcia first. You, well, you can use lambda functions to test lambda functions. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but what tests to test though? Uh, what well, tests to test? I, I think there is uh, the there is uh, when you are building lambda functions, everybody is like, oh, you cannot test it locally. Well, you can. Uh, I will not recommend it. But what I will encourage everybody is to have a lambda functions that do one thing and one thing only, and then mm. inside your lambda function, you can always test your business logic. Like, what is the business logic, and you you need test that. Uh, mm. If that's called external service, you mock it and, and it's a unit test. It doesn't communicate with exterior. Basically, you should not need the internet to run that. And then you deploy to the cloud and then there you will have your integration test. And your integration test you can build in all types of formats. You can use a traditional uh, way of doing integration tests or you can use Lambda functions to uh, test mm. your deployed Lambda functions because you can, for example, if you're building a, a code pipeline, uh, you can pass the parameters, uh, what is the URL of the API gateway, for example, or the ARN of the Lambda function, and you can invoke it. Mm. And there you can test that the Lambda function is connecting to the services that it should be connecting, and it's returning what it should be returning. One thing here is uh, always the challenge. Should we do this in a staging environment? We don't have Correct. the data, how to manage that. And I think that's very depending on what you're testing and, and what kind of critical data you have. The harder it becomes when you are doing transactions and there you might need to have a sandbox environment or things like that. So you are not <laughs> yeah. spending random money or calling uh, third party services. So it's always good to have some sandbox mm. account. Usually third party services always allow you to have a third part, uh, sandbox account that you can run your test against. So. Yeah, Kubis and I actually discussed this last time, and we talked about like how to do proper testing and how to do all of those things. So there's a there's a whole in, uh, whole discussion about how and where you should test. So mm. go to our YouTube channel. The I think it should be somewhere um, around here. Not Kobus, not Darko. You cannot see it from our names, but um, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it not Kobus, not Darko. That's the name of the YouTube we channel. Can do this quickly. Ah, that's one there. So see, this yeah. is a pre. I didn't make a banner for this one. Apologies. Yeah, but you so, can see it over there. 
not Kobus, not Darko. Check it out there. Mm. There's recordings of previous streams there as well. So, um, mm. um, and I think we are, we need to slowly wrap up here. And yeah, but Kobus there is one just... question I want to take and and point this person to because I I think we should. There is this Pepe, uh, front end developer, and I would really recommend you Amplify. Uh, just mm. go to my yeah, YouTube yeah. channel. I hope like. 20 videos on Amplify on how to get started from nothing to building something with Amplify, mm. or then just go to the Amplify documentation. Uh, they have really good uh, tutorials there if you are using mm. something else than React. But if you, they have iOS, mm. they have Android, Flutter, View, Angular, whatever you are building, mm. there is sure an integration yeah. with Amplify. So and sorry, I now have to be the stern dad and say today we have a very hard stop at one. So okay. thank you everybody one for joining us today. Um, Marcia, thank you. We hope to have you on this um, stream again soon. And uh, thanks for joining us this week. And apologies for the very abrupt ending, which is going to be in three, two, one. Bye.